My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University and I'm here today with Russell Pearson and this is part of our 100 year life project and along with us is Sarah Bolin and Alex Bishop and thank you for having us today. Yes ma'am. You're quite welcome. Let's start with learning a little bit about your childhood beginning with when and where you were born. Well I was born December 15, 1911 on a farm out three, three miles north of Mangum, Oklahoma on land that my great-grandmother filed on when they opened up that country. Okay. And what was her name? Her name was, was uh, her, la her last name was Cannon. First name I believe was Elizabeth. It's unusual for a woman to get land, isn't it? Ma'am? It was unusual for a woman to have land at that point. I don't know. Might have been. Might have been. But these pioneer women, uh, you, you could expect nearly anything out of them. <laughs> well, where did you go to elementary school? Where did you what? Elementary school. Elementary? Well, my, my introduction to elementary school was, was uh, there in the community about a mile and a half from our farm. Uh, little one room school called PUSH, P U S H. And how many were I, in your class? I don't have any idea. I wouldn't, uh, my memory wouldn't go back that far. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I probably was the only one, because it was just a small school, one room. And what did your father do for a living? Well, my father was. Uh, in, the, in the early, in his teenagers, he was a farm kid and also a part-time cowboy. And then as he matured, he started farming on his own. So you grew up on a farm? Yes, ma'am. I grew up on a farm. What were some of your chores? Well, mainly chores. Well, you did whatever was to be done. Uh, I helped milk uh, back, back then most most farms in addition to having a few uh, beef cows they had some dairy cows yeah usually jerseys to uh, so they'd have a little cream check they separated the milk and had cream check uh, for when they went to town on Saturday, and that's, that's when they bought the groceries. And they uh, they hoped that there'd be enough cream and eggs to go to the produce house and you know, pay for the groceries for the next week. Of course, they had a lot of a lot of groceries. You might say that they grew that that they're on the farm. Sure. My mother canned hundreds of jars of vegetables and fruit and meat. And did you have a, a favorite thing that you like to do for fun? For fun? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Depends what, they, what age. As eight or nine or ten, I guess you'd have to say hide and seek was the main one the main fun that the kids had when they got together there in the neighborhood. Also, uh, we only lived about a mile or so from the river and swimming was uh, a very active participation. Sure. And was religion an important part? What? Was religion a, a, an important part? Religion? Mm -hmm. Yes, it certainly was. My, my parents set a good example. Well, in high school, what did you think you would want to do when you grow, grew up? Well, there wasn't any question in my mind during those high school days. I was very active in athletics. I was not very big, only weighed about 100, 135 pounds. 
but I took to distance running at an early age and uh, I was reasonably successful at it in, in high school competition. So I was determined that I was going to be an athletic coach. But I got my mind changed about that. My about two weeks before I went off to college at A and M, Oklahoma A and M. My dad and I had been to town in the farm wagon, and on the way back home, he said, "Son." He said, uh, you, you're going to have to make up your own career. He said, I know you want to be an athletic coach because you've been fairly successful as an athlete. But if I could have my way, I'd like to see you study up at Oklahoma A&M to be what Mr. Georgia is. Well, Mr. Georgia was our county agricultural extension agent. No, I want to be an athletic coach. Well, he said, that, that's, that's for you to make up your mind, but he said, we farmers could use a lot of help, and uh, county extension agents have the information that we need. So uh, I'd still like for you to be a, a train, to train yourself to be a county extension agent, because uh, we farmers can use a lot of help. Well, I went on to any of my enrolled in physical education major, but what my dad had said to me just kept ringing in my ears. I'd like to see you study to be what Mr. George is, a county agricultural agent. So after I'd been enrolled in physical education for about two weeks, I switched majors and jumped over into agriculture. I've never been sorry that I made the change. It's been a, it, it hasn't been a rich life, but it's been a very good life. Well, how, how had you decided to go to Oklahoma A&M to begin with? Well, we, we were farm folks, and I had, a, I had a relative who lived in Stillwater, and her husband owned a small cafe, and she said to me, he, he said to me, Russell, if you come to a and I'll give you a job in my cafe for your meal, for your meals. Well, that, that guaranteed me a, 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 the opportunity to go to the college, that's for sure. And uh, I went on up to a &M. I enrolled in physical education as a major. But my dad, what he had said to me on that wagon trip back from town that day, a couple of weeks before school started, I just couldn't get get couldn't get that out of my head. Son, if if I had my way, I'd like to see you study to be a county agricultural agent like Mr. Georgia. So two weeks in the, after I enrolled at a and I switched over to agriculture. I've never been sorry. And what did your dad say when you told him you had switched? Well, he was pleased, but he wanted me to do what I needed to do. He was a, he wasn't highly educated, but he sure was a smart guy. Were you the first in your family to go to college? No. I had it at my sister, was six years older than I was. She she enrolled in college. To, I guess you'd say training to be a teacher, but she didn't stay with it. So you were the first to graduate from college. Yes. Then. Uh, I was first one in, among, among a whole raft of cousins, I was the first one to graduate from high school, from college. From college. Do 
Do you remember driving your first tractor? My first tractor, you might say, was a span of mules. <laughs> or, or did they have that or person? Well, my dad raised person horses. Big black. With maybe a white blaze and some white feet, but mainly black. Uh, what prompted that? I don't remember what. What your question was? When you drove your, do you remember your first tractor? Well, we didn't have a tractor when I was a kid. We, we worked horses and mules, as did just about everybody else. I bet there were, I bet there were not a dozen farm tractors in Greer County when I was a kid. Just or about the only tractor we'd see would be when they'd bring the thrashing machine to our farm and there's always a big old thrasher that burned either coal or wood that furnished the power. But the farm tractors to use in cultivating the crop, there weren't many. Yeah. Everybody used horses and mules. Did you remember the mule's name? <laughs> well, if it was, if it was a, 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 what we call a horse mule, well, his name would be Jake. And uh, a mare mule, probably Judy. <laughs> well, what was the favorite food that your mother cooked for you? Well, we didn't have much choice. We grew it out on a farm, whatever it was. But uh, I liked her, uh, I liked those hot biscuits with more than a butter on them and a couple of fried eggs, sunny side up, and either some ham or some bacon, which was meat that we had cured when we butchered the hogs. That was usually in cooler weather. What? That would be in cooler weather. Yeah, sure. We we we, we waited till it was a cold spell, and then we we usually kept, uh, killed, butchered anywhere from two to five head of hogs, and the neighbors did too, and we all got together for the hog killing, and. Uh, Divided uh, who, who's ever place we were at. Well, we we gave the neighbors some fresh meat to take home with them. And that was that was customary. That's the, that's the way the farm folks lived. Mm -hmm. You see, that was back in the 1920s. Before electricity and running water. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, if we had any running water, it was because we spilled it coming up a hill from the well. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. And then, then, then we went back and got some more. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no electricity to land sakes, no. I was, a uh, I was a county agricultural agent before they even tried to uh, Get the electricity out to the farm, sir. And in fact, I, I held them. I was kept by that time. I was county agricultural agent in Garvin County, Paul Valley County seat, and uh, I organized the meetings where the farmers decided whether or not they wanted. To <coughs> Excuse me, where the farmers decided whether or not they wanted to have electricity. Most of them couldn't afford it right at that time. But well, we got it started. Rural Electric? Rural Electric? REA? Yes, that's what REA, Rural Electric. Because the utilities didn't want to 
spend the money to get electricity out all, all over the country. So we went to REA. Or what were holidays like back in your childhood? Holidays? Mm -hmm. Well, in the summertime, unless it was the 4th of July, we didn't take any holiday. We went back to the field and worked. And uh, school term, uh, if there was any organized celebrations, well, we took part in it. What about Christmas? What? What about Christmas? Oh, well, Christmas had a family time, and we always had a Christmas tree out there on the farm, usually at, at one of the grandparents' places, and we, we celebrated. We, we tried to... My, my, my folks were quite religious. In fact, uh, Grandpa Pearson and Grandma Pearson helped to organize the first Baptist church that was in Landingham. They, they were charter members of getting it organized. So uh, we celebrated Christmas with proper recognition of the part Jesus had in it. At, at low cost presents that Santa Claus brought, we thought <laughs> hey, it was a celebration. Well, did music play a part? Well, it did. We'd sing, yes. That, that might be the only music we had because a, a, a lot of farm folks didn't have musical instruments. They might have, a, might maybe have a piano. We didn't. We had an organ that you pumped to get the wind for the organ. My my mother was quite musical, and her father brought her an organ while they still lived in Illinois, and brought it down to. River County where they bought the land down there. But uh, mainly it was singing. And did you did you sing? What? Did you sing? All the kids sang. <laughs> Do you have a favorite song? <laughs> you gotta remember you're asking a question to which the answer would have been 90 years ago. Well, even today, though, do you have one that, if you were going to sing something, what would it be? Well, whatever the whatever the grown folks wanted, it wouldn't make any difference. Wouldn't make it. What about dancing? Yeah, we, we, all, we all did. All of us did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the older folks did, did square dancing. Us kids, I'm talking about anywhere from 10 years old on up to 15, 12, 18, uh, we did ra round dancing. I guess that's what you call it. That's what we called it. <laughs> Well, do you remember your first car? Absolutely. It was a, it was a, a 1925 Model T Ford touring car. We made a good cotton crop that year. Papa bought his automobile. We gave five hundred and twenty-three dollars for it, brand spanking new. Mm. Ford Touring Car. Well, we, th we thought we were really in the high cotton. 
But by, by, by that time, there was uh, quite a few cars out in the country. So the main cash crop was cotton? Yeah, our main cash crop. Everybody's main crop was either cotton or wheat. And we grew both of them. And where would you take the cotton to market? Well, hometown. Mangum. We just lived three miles out of Mangum, and they had five or six cotton gins in Mangum. So that's where we took it. Five or six? Yeah, at one time we had, I think, I think one time there were seven cotton gins in town. Now there's probably not even one. Yeah, there's, a, I think it's still one, Farmer's Co-op, which my dad, <laughs> my dad helped organize. And was there an ice plant in Mangum? A what? An ice plant? Absolutely. Well, we, most of the time we couldn't afford it, but yeah, there's, there's an ice plant there. Uh, they, they made great big blocks of ice and they peddled it around town to the places that needed ice and the uh, families that needed ice and could afford it. Usually you didn't buy over about 25 pound block. Sometimes you'd get a 50 pounder. Yeah, because we didn't have electricity until, oh, land sakes. We didn't have, there wasn't electricity in, in Greer County except from the plant there in Mangum, electric plant. There wasn't any electricity until the 1930s. I've been through Magnum oh, a couple of years ago and they have a beautiful WPA library. Do you remember when they were building that? No. Would have been, probably been in the 40s. You would have already gone, I guess, by then, in the 40s. Okay, so once you got to Oklahoma A&M, tell us a little bit about that. Where did you live? I lived in Hanner Hall. As the boys, that was the new boys' dormitory. There was an older boys' dormitory there called Crutchfield Hall. But I was lucky and got a room with a roommate in in Hanner Hall, and uh, and I guess until I started batching in my senior year. I had the same room all the time there, room 204, cost me, cost me a fortune, four dollars a month <laughs> for my room, and I was working for the board the first couple of years, and then I got a job with the college as a student employee. In my junior year, I guess it was, and boy, we thought we were. Oh, us boys thought we were bankers, really, because we got fifteen cents an hour working there in the cotton laboratory. Fifteen cents an hour, and we're allowed to make twelve dollars and a half a month. By George, we got by on it. We didn't. We didn't buy any T-bone steaks at the restaurant, <laughs> anything like that. Did our own cooking. Did your own cooking. Uh huh. Did your own cooking. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was four of us boys together there, and uh, one of them did the cooking, and then we we. The other three shared with ghost. I take it you are not the cook? 
I was not the cook. <laughs> oh, I'd, I, I'd fry eggs and stuff like that. But uh, as far as cooking goes, we had one guy that was uh, pretty talented that way, and we turned the cooking over to him. Well, do you have a favorite memory from Oklahoma A&M? Yeah. Um, uh, what did you say, favorite what? Memory. Oh, yeah. You bet. I was a freshman. I had had a pretty good high school athletic career in track. I was a distance runner. Ran everything from a quarter mile on up to two mile. And, and was on the mile relay team. In fact, I was the anchor on the mile relay team. Ran the final lap. And uh, well, my, I guess my favorite surprise experience was when I was a freshman, I, I knew I was going to, I had a relative, that I may have told you this before, I had a relative who told me, Russell, if, uh, if you go to A&M, you're going to graduate this spring, if you go to A&M, I'll give you a job in my cafe for your board. Well, I'd guaranteed an education. So I took him up on it the first two years, and then the depression hit, and he finally went out of business. But uh, I had had a pretty good, pretty good career as a high school senior in running distance races. So when well, the cross country team got time for them to start practicing, which was just even before school started there at NM. I went out with them, and there was, oh, there was uh, the varsity team. And back in those days, a freshman could not compete in the varsity, you had to wait till your sophomore year. But uh, uh, the varsity team got together, and we freshmen who wanted to, wanted to try to eventually make a team in our sophomore year, we, we met with them that first day, first day of practice. And they said, uh, okay, where, where are we going to run to today? Well, somebody said, well, why don't we run out to the sheep barn and back? Well, it was about a mile and a quarter out to the sheep barn, a mile and a quarter back. So we ran out there, and it so happened that I had been running all summer long, because I sure wanted to make the track team at a &M. So we, we ran out to the sheep barn and back. Got back while everybody was blowing just like a steam engine, except me because I had been running all summer long out there in the buffalo grass pastures and uh, I was in good shape. They said, how come, you, how come you're not breathing like everybody else? Well, I said, I'm not, I'm not out of air wind. I, I, got, I still got my breath. So that led to bigger things. They finally went on up into the season in early November, or late October maybe, when I was out running all the varsity except the top man. And uh, some of the varsity guys came to me and said, Russell, there's a race that you ought to run. You ought to run that in a Tulsa Marathon. It's a five mile race. They said, We think we think you could show pretty good pretty good in a place up there pretty high. Ah, oh, I said, that's for the big guys. 
I'm just a freshman. Well, we still think you could do pretty good in it. And they just kept nagging me, the varsity runners did. So I finally gave in and said, okay. So that morning of the race, I'd never been to Tulsa. I got on a bus, went out to, went over to Tulsa to the athletic club, went in and changed clothes to, to a track suit. And it was the, the entire five miles was in Tulsa, up and down hills. If you've ever been to Tulsa, you know that some parts of town are just hills, hills, hills. So I decided that by the golly, if I was going to do any good, I was going to have to stay up pretty close to the front. So when, when we took off, I jumped up to the oh, first half a dozen guys in the race. And uh, we started out and I got about a mile, mile and a half into the race. And the motorcycle cop who was accompanying us to show us the route. He said, hey kid, you're getting, you're getting quite a way ahead of them. Why don't you slow down? Well, I said, that's the way you lose races. You slow down. So I, I just kept hammering and uh, stayed out stayed out in the lead. Got about a oh, mile from the finish, maybe a mile and a half. He said, hey kid, you are, you've got a big lead on them. Why don't you slow down? No, 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 I'm not going to. So I just kept hammering. And I did, I finished a good, oh, I don't know, 300 yards ahead of the pack again. And uh, I won the Tulsa run. Uh, which surprised everybody except our varsity men who, who had talked me into running the thing. And uh, that's, what did you ask me to tell you about, about something that I enjoyed or yes. something that, well that, that was, that was the first big thrill I had, was winning that Tulsa run. Because I had not expected to. In fact, I'd, I'd felt like if I, if I could finish in the top five or six, I, I'd have been doing pretty good. But instead of that, I won the darn thing. <laughs> and, uh, and it is still remembered by some of the guys who were in that race. Yeah, I remember you winning that Tulsa run. You were just a dang freshman. I don't, we, didn't, we didn't think you could do it. Well, I, I won it. Got, got a big trophy about so tall. And uh, uh, from, from there I went to... Uh, they, they, did, they didn't have a... Oklahoma A&M and the conference at that time was in the Missouri Valley Conference and they, they didn't have any freshmen cross country run in the Missouri Valley. But the, the, the next spring they did have a freshman track meet with all the schools in the Missouri Valley Conference. Uh, they all did their running on the same day. They ran it the, the, on their own track, but they were all all the same day. Well, I, I ran a I ran a half mile and a mile and a two mile and a, and a high jump. And uh, I didn't know how to place because you, you ran there at home and the coach wired your time to the Missouri Valley headquarters. And that's the end of it. 
So uh, when I got back to school in the fall, I asked the coach, I said, hey, how, how did I do in that Missouri Valley freshman uh, cross country or track, track meet? Well, I said, my, my Georgia did pretty good. He said, you, in the Missouri Valley Conference, you were the second in the half mile, you were second in the mile, and you won the two mile. Boy, I felt, I felt pretty big. And I don't remember how I placed the high jump, probably, probably didn't even place. But uh, that, that, was, that was a big thrill. That was a big thrill of my freshman year. Winning the two mile in the Missouri Valley freshman meet. Well, once end of the story. Not, not <laughs> quite. <laughs> uh -huh. Did you continue to run after you graduated? Yes, I, uh, I, I ran all through college. I was not exactly a star. I, I won a few and lost lost several, but I did keep running. Wait a minute. Once you started work, did you did you run? I mean, is that yeah, did yeah, you continue? Yeah. Did, were you in any other marathons? Well, the one that Tulsa run, I guess that's the only marathon I ran. But, uh, well, I ran on the college cross country team in the Missouri Valley. We 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 won the Missouri Valley cross country <coughs> every year that I ran. Well, what year did you graduate from OAMC? That's a long story. I I got. got I went on through A&M until my beginning of my senior year, junior year, and the depression hit, and uh, I just didn't have any money. My dad didn't have any money. We went to we went to Mangum. He'd been a customer of the bank there for 25 years, I guess. Banker said, well, Arthur, you've been a good customer. You've already kept your interest paid. And when the note came due, you've always paid the note. But we are not loaning any money to anybody. That was in the, in the Roosevelt Depression. So, um, I thought, well, that gum, I, I can't go to college this fall. So I stayed home and picked cotton and did a hired out for anything that would pay money. And, and uh, I finally decided, well, now this not get, this is not going to get it. I've got to get back in college. So I called the head of the Field Crops and Soils Department at A&M and I reminded him that I was going to major in Field Crops and Soils. Could he find any job at all for me? Well, he said, we, we've got a little money that we can hire boys with. He said, uh, why don't you come up to A&M and we'll talk about it. Well, I said, I'll, I'll have to hitchhike because I haven't got any money for train fare or bus fare. Well, he said, you come on up any way you can get here and we'll talk about it. So uh, I went on up to NM there in probably November. He said, uh, and I met with the head of the department. He said, uh, yeah, I said, We've got room for four boys, and we can pay you 
twenty dollars a month. Man, that sounded like my real money. So I took the job. About a couple of weeks, the dean of agriculture called us in and said, "Fellows, got bad news for you. Our appropriations been cut. We can't afford overpaying you. We will we'll give you." Well, we'll give you fifteen dollars a month, but that's all we can afford. We took it. We got by on it. Another two or three weeks came by. He called us in again and said, "Fellas, more bad news. All we're going to be able to pay you is twelve dollars a month, and you're going to work for fifteen cents an hour." So we took it. We finally ended up batching with one of the guys doing the cooking, but we made it. Went on through college, and from there on, I worked for the agronomy department, field crops and soils department, for fifteen dollars a month. What, what, except when it was twelve dollars, but I was glad to get it, and that continued until. Until I graduated, only uh, only I didn't graduate like I thought I would. I, uh, the the department ran out of, ran out of money again, and we just got by on whatever they could afford. But uh, it so happened that that was when Roosevelt became president, and he started a government farm program, and uh, the county extension agents were in charge of the program in the county. So one day I was working there in the cotton laboratory, fifteen cents an hour. And the uh, crop judging coach came in and said, "Russell, how would you like to be an assistant county agent?" I said, well, "Mr. Staten, I don't have my degree." He said, "I don't think it'll make any difference. These county agents are behind the eight ball, and they got to have some help. And the extension service is why hiring seniors." Who are majoring in agriculture and sending them out as assistant county agent to help the county agents with this government farm program? He said, "Would you like to be one?" I said, "Well, we can talk about it." He said, "I tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll have uh, Mr. Staten, your your." Crop judging coach, come in and talk to you about it. Let's see if he can work it. So he did. A couple of days later, State came in and talked to him, and we decided if you got a county for me, or I can be assistant agent, I'll take it. So they sent me down to Hollis. Farthest away county agent job there was. I became assistant county agent uh, there in Harmon County, and I stayed with that a year and a half. I said to the district agent, uh, "When are you going to have a?" He had been sending assistant county agents over to a new county and being a county agent. I said, "When are you going to have a county for me?" Well, he said, "Russell, we haven't forgotten you, but the right county for you has not come along yet. It hasn't opened up. When it does, I'll let you know." Well, it's about a month, and he came in. He called me and said, "Russell, that county is open now. Do you you want to take a shot at it?" I said, "Yeah. Where is it?" He said, "Paul's Valley." 
one of the better counties in Oklahoma, Garvin County. He said, we were waiting for a county like this to open up for you. So they sent me to Garvin County, meet the county agents, county commissioners. Well, county commissioners said to me and to the district agent, well, we kind of had the, our own idea of who we wanted to take that county agent's place. Uh, we, we'd like to put the guy who is the assistant there now in the county agent's spot. Well, the district agent said, no, that's not the way the a &M extension does it. We pick the man, we present him to you. If you want him, fine. If not, we send you somebody else. Well, we had our minds set on the man that's assistant agent there now. No, District Agent says, we don't do it that way for a good reason. When we do it that way, it gives that assistant agent, while he's being only the assistant, sometimes they start cutting the rug out from under the county agent in order to try to get the job for themselves. He said, no, we'll pick the man. You, you approve him or don't approve him. Well, they said, uh, Pearson seems to know what to do. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll take him. So I became county agent there in Garvin County, Paul Valley, and uh, stayed 11 years. Had a very good career. Very good experience. And uh, uh, then finally, the people at the a &M asked me, would I like to have a job there on the campus in charge of the Oklahoma Crop Improvement Association, which is the certified seed organization for the state. I'd have charge of the whole state. So I looked at it and we decided that's what it did. And uh, then pretty soon uh, they, they asked me to come up on the campus up there at and m take over as an extension agronomist, which I did. And the thing just went up, up, up after that. <laughs> I have bored you enough. No. <laughs> then what? I understand you did some radio. <laughs> well, yeah. Radio and TV. Uh, from that, from that uh, job as charge of seed certification in Oklahoma. A&M asked me to, what I like to t take on a job as, as head man of the marketing division of the State Board of Agriculture. I took a look at it and did. And I stayed with that for about a year and and uh, Oklahoma a and called me again, said, uh, we got another job here we think you'd like, and, and we think you're the man for the job. Charge of marketing with homes here at Stillwater. Well, I took it, and things just went from good to better. And uh, after I'd been the marketing director for, I don't know, a year or two, uh, A&M called me again. He said, Russell, uh, WKY Radio and Television is looking for a farm director for the broadcasts. He said, uh, We've got several applications, and we'd like to have yours because we think you're the man for the job. 
So I went up and talked to the powers that be, and sure enough, they hired me. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I did pretty good with it. From that, oh, things get a little bit fuzzy. I finally ended up as the extension agronomist at Oklahoma and m and uh, WKY, some of the guys at WKY called me, said, Russell, WKY has asked us to find him a farm broadcaster. We got several applications for the job, but uh, if you want it, we think you're the man for it. Well, I said, what does it pay? Well, it paid quite a bit more than what I had. So I said, I'll take a look at it. So I did. I went and talked to the management of WKY Radio and Television. I said, I like what I see, but there's one, one hitch. I've been told that WKY Radio and Television is getting ready to close out their farm department. I said, I don't want to go to a funeral. Oh, they said, it's not true. Well, I said, I, I want to verify that it's not, not true. Because I don't want to go down there and be there for a little while and then have me out of a job. I said, do you mind if I go talk to Ed Gaylord? Now, the Gaylords were owned WKY radio and television. So uh, Ed Gaylord, that's the boy, not Mr. E.K. Ed. Ed and I were acquainted, so I went down and talked to Ed Gaylord. He said, Russell, I know enough about you that I know you can handle it. But he said, uh, I, I can give you this insurance if you want the job. WKY is not ready to close their farm account, farm broadcast, and I assure you that, that job will be there as long as you do a good job of it, and we think you'll always do a good job. So I took the WKY radio and television job, handled it for, I don't remember how many years, but uh, I enjoyed it. And finally, became finally the marketing division opened up at the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, and they paid a lot more money. I took it, handled it a while, and then got an even better job. You were always up for a challenge, sounds like. Yeah, yeah. It was good. Had a good reputation. What? You had a good reputation. Oh, I guess I had a fair reputation. That's a question. <laughs> well, I, did, I didn't get any complaints. <laughs> uh, you were married. Were you ever married? What? Were you ever married? Yeah. T tell us a little bit about your courtship. The way you ask that question, I think you know a little about it ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you told me how you met your wife earlier. Yeah, when I well, mm -hmm. um, I was, I guess I was a junior at a and and working, working out on the experiment station in the summertime Fifty dollars a month from sun up to sundown, and there was four of us boys, and we took our noon meal at at a boarding house there in Stillwater that kept girls boarding room during the school term. Well, there 
about the second week of September so long in there, those four boys came in that place to lunch, sweaty, and I guess smelly. And there was a whole parlor full of girls. Pretty good looking girls, too. Well, there was one cute little blonde headed girl, blue eyed. She uh, had on a gingham dress that her mother had made out of, out of chicken laying mash sacks. Back in those days, these feed companies sacked up a lot of their feed in, in uh, printed gingham, sacks made out of printed gingham. And this girl had on a little pink and white dress that her mother had made out of flower out of a feed sack. And I thought, by the way, I'm going to see if I can't sit by that little girl when the house mother called us to lunch. So I got over in pretty good position. And, and sure enough, the house mother called her lunch is ready. So I asked her, come on, come over here and I'll get you a chair. So I got a place where there were two chairs, one for her and one for me, there at the table. And that was, uh, that was our first acquaintance. And she was everything she looked to be. So uh, farmhouse fraternity had been trying to pledge me, but I didn't have any money. I couldn't join, didn't have any money. And I told them so. So one day, one, one day they, they came to me and said, Russell, we we're going to have a, a hayrack ride. Would you like to bring your date and be our guest at this hayrack ride? They said, it won't cost you anything. We'll furnish the weenies and the marshmallows and all, everything, the iced tea. Well, I said, then let me see if this little girl that I got in mind might like to go on a hayrack ride. So I, I caught her out in the hall. It so happened that the cotton laboratory where I worked was in Whitehurst Hall, which was also a classroom building. So I knew what her schedule was, and I caught her out in the hall. Said, would you like to go on a hay rack ride? Oh, I would love it. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, I told her what it was. That was our first date. We had a hay rack ride, went out to Boomer Lake, there just north of town. And things went from, the, from good to better. We went together all that semester and the next one. And uh, her daddy had told her, said, when, when you're going over to Oklahoma and m and I'm having to pay the bill. He said, you're 18 years old or 17. That's about when most girls begin to think about getting married. He said, if I'm going to pay for your college education, two years of it, so, so you can get a teacher's certificate to teach school, uh, you got to promise me that you won't get married for two years. So she told him, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to get married. So we went to, Bernice and I went together all during that semester and and, and the, the next semester. And then I went out as assistant county agent. And she got to school teaching in Noble County there, a one room school, 14 kids. And she taught all eight grades. And uh, she taught two years. But in the meantime, I got a job as assistant county agent, and there was an assistant down at Hollis, Harmon County. 
Her school was out on Friday of the second year of her teaching. And on that next Sunday, she was no longer Bernice Strom. <laughs> I took care of that. <laughs> she became Bernice Pearson. And we had 17 years of very, very happy married life. And then God called her home. And I've been a bachelor ever since. 67 years? 67 years of married life. And, and do you have any secrets to keeping one going that long? Well, first of all, let God be your guide. And he was. Uh, I had a policy. You cook it. By George, I'll eat it. <laughs> but I knew I was safe because she was an outstanding 4-H club girl and she knew all the ins and outs about homemaking. So uh, she, she did the cooking for 67 years. I sat at the table with her and it was good. Did you have any children? Children? Mm -hmm. Yeah. After we'd been married a year and a half, along came a little girl whose, whose name we had picked out uh, even before, well, soon after we were engaged. Uh, we were downtown, well, ahead of that. Men who were lettermen in athletics, got to go to the student senate dances free, except for five cents, which was a tax. So uh, one night of a dance, Maurice and I were walking down the street there in, in downtown Paul by Stillwater, stopped in front of a grocery store that had a nice display. <laughs> a jewelry store that had a nice display and uh, we were looking at the rings because we knew we were finally going to need one even though we couldn't afford one right then. And while we were there we said uh, we don't know when it'll be but after we get married at some point there's going to be a third member of our family. Uh, if it's a boy, we'll name him after our, 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 our daddies. Her daddies was Timothy Edgar Strom, and mine was Charles Arthur Pearson. So we're going to call him Timothy Arthur, initials T-A-P, Timothy Arthur Pearson. And uh, we didn't buy a ring then because we couldn't afford one. But we did finally get married. And a year and a half after we were married, uh, we got supposedly Timothy Arthur Pearson started. But we just in case it it wasn't a boy. We picked out a girl's name too. I said, "What do we, what do we make it a, a combination of your name and mine?" Her name was Bernice. My middle name was Lavere, L-A-V-E-R-E, -E, Russell Lavere Pearson. So we settled on that. Whatever the first kid was, if it was a girl, it would be uh, a combination of, of her name and mine. And if it was a boy, it would be Timothy Arthur after her daddies. Well, 
uh, showing up it was a girl. So we took the L.A. out of my middle name, LeVere, and put the latter part of her name to finish it up, Bernice, so the name was La Nice. And when she, came, when, she, when she arrived, that's what we called her, Lise Joanne Pearson. And God let us keep that girl for, well, six, again, 67 years. And then he took her home. The second girl, the second child was also a girl, six years later, and we called her Patricia Gale. And both of them became school teachers. God called Lenise home about two, three months ago. And Patricia became a school superintendent, very much in demand. She had a, she was superintendent in Oklahoma, school superintendent in New Mexico, school superintendent in Colorado, school superintendent in, in uh, Kansas, and then she retired. What do you, uh, being 101, what do you, what, what's your secret to living so long, do you think? What, what do you attribute your Number life? one, let God be your guide. I, I haven't followed him every time, but, but that was the main thing. Live, live close to the Lord, and when you're wrong, admit it. Uh, and then I had a, I may have already told you this, I had a policy, I married a life policy. You cook it, I eat it. And no complaints. I never one time complained about Bernice's cooking. Because first of all, she was a super cook. <laughs> she had been a 4-H club girl and a very successful one. And then uh, she cooked, well, when she was eight years old, if you can believe this, when she was eight years old, her mother had to go to Kansas to take care of a sick relative, and it was threshing time. This was back in the days when they, when the grain binder came in and cut your wheat and put it in shocks, and then the threshing machine and a crew that hauls bundles to the thresher they're on your farm, uh, made the rounds of the farms and the thrashing. Well, uh, this lady, this little relative in Wichita, Kansas, got ill during wheat harvest. And it so happened that the, the thrashing machine would come to the Strom farm. Well, when Mrs. Strom had to be in Wichita, Kansas, taking care of the sick folks. So, Bernice was the oldest child. She was eight years old. She cooked for the threshing crew, which would be about, oh, anywhere from a dozen to 15 or 20 people, depending on how big a crew it was. At eight years old, she, she cooked for the threshing crew. Nobody really thought anything about it. That's just what it was. And today, at, at your age, 101, what would you say, what, what's your philosophy? What motto do you live by? Well, as I mentioned maybe briefly a while ago, live close to the Lord. Try to let the Lord be your guide. And, uh, well, uh, eat what's set before you. 
get plenty of exercise. Of course, that's no no problem out on a farm. Uh, that's pretty much it. And what what do you do today to that gives your life meaning, purpose? Well, what are some things that you no, do that again? What are some things you do today so that gives life meaning for you? Well, uh, I try. Uh, I try to. This is a repetition. Mm -hmm. I try to live close to the Lord. Uh, follow His commands. Uh, don't 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 wear don't wear it on your sleeve. In other words, don't be a goody goody. Be reasonable. But live a life so that people know that Christ is is your ambassador and your guide. Now, now, when when history is written, what do you want it to say about you? <laughs> I guess I'll let them do the writing. <laughs> I, I want them to, to to let it be known that I tried to live a good Christian life and that I loved agriculture love being a part of it and having and this sounds like bragging but having leadership roles in agriculture because i did have i was assistant county agent i was county agricultural agent i was head of the marketing division of the oklahoma state board of agriculture i uh, well i could go on and on and on uh, i had i had a good I had a good professional life. At what point did you think you'd be living to be a hundred? Well, frankly, I didn't give it much thought. Okay. I did what I hadn't lived. I tried to be useful. I tried to live a good Christian life. Not by telling people that was a goody goody, but by letting my actions speak louder than words in, in setting an example. That's about it. <laughs> what gets you up in the morning? What? What gets you up in the morning? Somebody hollering, hey, time <laughs> to get up. <laughs> Is there anything you look forward to? each new day? Oh, uh, yeah, I do. I have a, I've had an interesting professional life and I look forward to doing what I need to do. Anything else you want to add before we close off? I think you've given me plenty of time to brag. And <laughs> I've, I've tried not to be boastful just to put the facts out before you. Well, was there anything you tried to do that just didn't work? Probably, but I don't remember what it might have been. You just always rose to the occasion. What? Always rose to the occasion. Yeah, well, yeah. Something rose. <laughs> <laughs> There is one thing that I probably need to mention here. Uh, I got two girls, both of them, each of them successful. Uh, my youngest one has had a great experience as superintendent of schools. She loves kids. She loves being superintendent. She was kind to the kids to the school teachers that she supervised. My oldest daughter, Lanice, was quite an athlete. She, she was a cheerleader in high school, an excellent golf player, and she and another girl won the duels, state duel one, one year. Uh, Lonnie's also 
that's my oldest daughter, upon my, uh, upon my insistence, took part in the Mrs. Senior America pageant in Oklahoma. And by the way, she won the title of Mrs. Senior America, Oklahoma. Now she, she competed in the in the Mrs. America pageant at uh, Atlantic City. I got an alibi for it. I'm not going to. She did not win, but she ranked in the top 15, which out of 51 or two is not bad. That's not bad at all, no. No. So she was officially Mrs. Senior America, Oklahoma. And did you go to Atlantic City with her? Yes. I saw, <laughs> that shows you how bad my memory is. I had to think back. Because doggone, I've been on so many trips. But yes, uh, I, I went to the Mrs. America of the USA with her. And she ranked in the top 15. Was that like in 2000? 10, 11, 11? Uh, 2010. Well then, I thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you, ma'am. You're very kind.